Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's lecture. Um, this one's going to be pretty brief because there's a lot to do today besides the lecture. So let me go ahead and get started. All right, so today our topic is water conservation, which is obviously really broad. Um, so I said there's a lot to do today. I'm going to do just a kind of a brief introduction to water conservation. Um, we have our guest speaker, as I mentioned at the end of last lecture, um, Dr. John Bergeron, who works as a policy analyst for Western Research Advocates. And then we do have discussion, sorry, discussion leader seven. So I don't want to take up too much time with the lecture because um, there's other things to do today as well. Some reminders. Um, so we have a discussion leader for today, um, as well as the participation, as always. Um, so make sure you go to the discussion board and you'll find both those items there. Um, please do both of them if you want credit for both of them. Um, so the discussion leader will have posted their comments, um, sorry, posted their questions by class time today, um, April 15th, and then you have 24 hours to respond to those. Um, the participation, participation um, points activity will be available till the next class period for you to do. Um, also, just a reminder, on April 20th, we do have assignment number three, which is due. If you have any questions or are struggling with that at all, I don't know why I put the number behind the three on that. Um, if you have any questions, just reach out to me, email me. Um, and then the following two lectures, um, we do have our pink time assignment. So April 22nd, there'll be no lecture um, to give you time to do your pink time assignment. And then the rubric, exactly how you did it last time, um, is due on the 27th. So today, learning objectives, I want to just fairly briefly um, explain some of the major components of the Clean Water Act. Um, those were covered in really in more in depth in the reading, so I don't want to get too repetitive to that because those are going to be the topics for the discussion leader discussion as well. Um, and then discuss the role of agriculture in contributing to water pollution, and then um, be able to talk about the work that John Bergen's doing as a water policy analyst. So those are the learning objectives for today. So I don't probably need to tell you how important water is, but here's some interesting figures and facts that I found. Um, so as of a 2015 estimate, the United States uses 332 billion gallons of water per day. That is a lot. Um, and this graph kind of shows you based on percentages for how that water is used. So surprisingly, especially on the West Coast, because this is more of a use on the East Coast, honestly, is this thermoelectric power. So energy production is a huge use of water and highly water intensive. Um, on the West Coast, what we're more used to seeing is water going towards irrigation, which is the second most common use um, with almost 37%. Um, you have public supply, so that's um, for a variety of things, industrial, aquaculture, mining, Domestic supply is only 1%, so actually the amount of water we're using in our homes is pretty minimal. Um, and then for livestock as well. By state, you can see the different amounts of water used. This is also in 2015, so this is water withdrawals in millions of gallons per day. Um, California and Texas are two of the top states. California is actually the number one user of water in the entire United States. Um, that can be explained for a few reasons. Um, one, the California population is significantly higher than any other state, so there are more people. Also, the amount of agricultural land that we have in California, of irrigated agricultural land, is fairly significant as well. So that is a huge use of water um, in California also. Here's another, move my face again. Um, here's another state by state. Um, so you can see the states on the left side of this figure are a lot of the western states. Um, so on, as I was saying, on the west coast you have this green, which if you look up at the key, is irrigation. So water on the west coast is largely, largely, largely used for irrigation. Or if you move to more of the midwest and the east coast, it's used more for energy production. Um, so that's 
pretty distinct differences between different parts of the United States. You see California is the number one user of water of any state in the country. Um, and just as I was talking about before, the majority of that does go to irrigation, that green bit. Um, so that's quite a lot of water that we use for growing food in California. And California does grow a lot of food, not just for us, but also for the entire country and even for the entire world, to be honest. A lot of things grown here are exported to other countries. Um, that just kind of shows you, these are all estimates for 2005. So I'm not sure how these have changed to now. Um, probably not super significantly. Um, yeah, I find this really interesting to compare the amount of water used in each state um, as well as what it's used for. Water pollution in the US is a huge problem. Um, not only do we use a lot of water, we also pollute a lot of water. So it's an estimated that 40% of lakes are too polluted for fishing and swimming. That is a huge percentage of lakes in the US that are extremely polluted. Um, another fact I found each year, 1.2 trillion gallons of untreated sewage, stormwater, and industrial waste are dumped into US waterways. That is a lot. Um, one thing you've probably heard about before is this third point here, which is the Mississippi River carries an estimated 1.5 million metric tons of nitrogen pollution, mostly from agriculture, into the Gulf of Mexico each year, which create the dead zone. Um, this is something, this dead zone is something that's talked about quite a bit in a lot of sustainability and environmental classes, so odds are you've heard of it before. Um, both these figures kind of show what that looks like from the air. Um, so basically you have massive amounts of agricultural runoff flowing from the Mississippi into the ocean. That kind of surge of nutrients um, creates a lot of plankton growth. Those plankton grow and then they die. Um, and when they're dead, that decomposition of their bodies um, takes up oxygen out of the water, which is basically why these are called dead zones, because they are areas of the ocean that are not, they don't have a lot of oxygen in them, which is obviously a huge problem for fish who need oxygen um, and other, lots of other species too, I'm sure, that need oxygen in that water. So that's why this is called the dead zone. So there's two major types of water pollution that the Clean Water Act does deal with. So you have point source pollution. These are some different examples of what po point source solution is, um, what it looks like. So this is pollution that comes from very specific source. You can trace it down to a factory, to a pipe, to something very specific, which is why it's called point source. And this is often what people generally think of when they think of water pollution, they think of this pipe coming from a factory into a river and dumping chemicals, whatever, into the water. However, almost more importantly is this non-point source water pollution. Um, so this is pollution that's basically the opposite is point source where you can't necessarily pinpoint it's coming from that pipe or that specific thing. It's more of just general runoff that goes into water sources. Um, the major one, as I said, is agriculture. So you have cropland. You know, farmers are using chemical fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, um, and not all that stays put, right? When it rains, it gets washed off. Um, into water sources as well, things like forestry, rural homes, suburban development, city streets. Um, water obviously can't soak into concrete, so that water has to go somewhere, um, which is why when it rains around here, you see it all rushing down to the drains. Those drains have to go somewhere. Um, so that's non-point source solution. All right, pollution. So the role of agriculture is I kind of already introduced um, from the one reading, it's the largest non-point source, um, source of water uh, pollution globally, not only in the United States is this a problem, but globally. Um, and this um, pollution can cost, estimated to cost Americans between 56 and $340 billion a year. Um, whether that be in lost economic gains, efforts to clean up the water, a variety of things go into that calculation, but it's extremely costly, this level of pollution we have in our waterways. Um, a really good local example is the Salton Sea, which is just over the mountains in the Imperial and Coachella Valleys. I mean, basically the Salton Sea is a closed system. So water runs into it and it 
never runs out, it just stays there. Um, and most of the water running into the Salton Sea is agricultural runoff. Um, there's a few natural rivers, but even those rivers are pretty heavily polluted. Um, so you have all this agricultural runoff going into the Salton Sea, and all those pollutants really just sit there. Um, so a few of the main ones, you have 3 million tons of salt annually, which is enough to fill 40,000 railway boxcars. So that's a lot of salt just being filtered into this water body, which is why it's called a salt and sea. It's salt. It is salt water. Um, and then 50 pounds of selenium, which is a highly toxic chemical. There's a, a bunch of other chemicals as well. Um, and this is obviously a problem for the water, right, in there, but it's also actually a huge health issue. Um, because particularly more recently, there's been a lot of water conservation efforts on these agricultural farms, which is great. It means they're using less water. However, that means there's less water flowing in to the Salton Sea. So there's less water to kind of dilute all of these pollutants. This is causing the sea to shrink, um, exposing these playas, what used to be lake bed, basically. And that kind of toxic dust is lifted up into the air with windstorms and actually causes a lot of major respiratory issues um, in that part of California. The biggest one being asthma. The statistics on childhood asthma and adult asthma um, are really quite sad and astounding um, in that part of California. So the Clean Water Act, just like a lot of these acts, um, came because there were certain kind of major environmental issues that were becoming more noticed. Um, so Rachel Carson, we've talked about her in the beginning of the semester, her book Silent Springs, which talked about the harmful impacts of DDT, a certain agricultural chemical, um, on um, waterways and particularly on birds, which is the picture on the left. Um, on the right, you have Cleveland's Cuyahoga River, which caught fire in 1869. And I was actually watching something about this earlier today, and it has caught between 1850 something and 1969, it caught fire almost a dozen times. So this is not an isolated incident. Um, and that's because the water was so polluted with flammable toxins, right? Um, this, all, this picture here in the middle is also taken from the river, and you can see someone who stuck their hand <laughs> in the river, and that's what it came out looking like. So that's not great. Um, and then just more scientific research was also being done about some of the health consequences of drinking polluted water. Um, and this is still obviously, you know, an issue today as far as clean drinking water supplies. So because of a lot of these issues, the Clean Water Act was created. Um, it was originally acted in, enacted in 1948, but the revised kind of more current version um, came out in 1972. So this is when it's general generally kind of attributed to 1972. I um, mean there are two major parts to this original act. So it looked at dealing with sewage um, and gave federal funding to build sewage treatment plants all over the country and also dealt largely with point source solution. Oh, so I don't know why I keep saying solution, point source pollution. Um, so looking at um, mitigating and um, regulating those very obvious sources of pollution. Um, the Clean Water Act was revised in 1987 to also include non-point source solution be pollution because this was obviously then starting to become recognized as also a major contributor to water um, pollution, not just these point source um, sources of pollution. Um, the Clean Water Act does have civil, criminal, and administrative enforcement tools, and it's administered unlike the ESA, which we covered last class period, um, this is covered by the Environmental Protection Agency, regulated by the EPA. So that's all I'm really going to lecture for today. This is just a very, like I said, a basic introduction to um, water conservation, water pollution, and the Clean Water Act. Um, so please do watch then part two, which will be Dr. Bergeron's um, kind of virtual guest lecture. I've basically sent him a list of questions to answer, which he's going to then video himself. He will have video, videoed himself answering those questions, and I'll post that as part two. So make sure you go ahead and watch both parts of the lecture 
and then go to the participation points. There will be questions from both part one and part two. Um, and then don't forget to do discussion leader seven, which is on the two readings for today. One of, that goes through the Clean Water Act and the other one that talks about agricultural pollution. So for next Monday, remember assignment three is due by class time. We're gonna talk about ocean conservation. So today was mostly about freshwater conservation. We're gonna talk more about ocean conservation. There are two readings. Um, they're both very short. They're both kind of more popular news pieces. So this should be something that's relatively easy to read. Um, as always, any questions, feel free to email me and I will lecture again on Monday.